Okay. How's everybody? Well, it's early, so I have like a good. Um, Ruth gave a good, like a, I think a good presentation or a, like a introduction to me. What did I do wrong? Sorry. It's all right. It's different. Okay. I'm gonna put my water here so I don't have this in front of my face. Um, buy a water bottle. Buy your own water bottle. Stop using little straws. I have a bamboo straw in my purse that I carry with a little. I like hippiness starts to take over more and more, but I think that when you serve, the future is bleak. <laughs> I say with a smile on my on my face. Um, oh, I'm a, I, I consider myself an activist over everything, but I'm also a mother. I have two kids at this point. They're 10 and almost 12. Um, they're staying with a friend. I'm divorced. I have a co-parent. He We were married and an awful person at the same time, and during the hurricane, we, we were very close. We're very, very tight, so find your community. Um, I, I've lived in the United States. I've lived in Puerto Rico. My family's from Puerto Rico and Cuba. Um, and at this point, most of my family's in the U.S. So my ex-husband and my mother-in-law, his mother, are my family now as well as my friends and my you know, people from, from this movement. So keep finding, be, beyond your immediate family, keep finding your tribe because your neighbors are going to be the ones that are going to be there for you when, when it comes, if it comes. And it may, it may not come. Um, so anyway, I was, I, wa I was a La Leche League leader. I quit in November, and some of it was when I was in that aftermath of Maria. My, my emotions were very, very raw. And I realized I had to, 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 to make some, some changes. So my, my, my work has, uh, has often focused on equity. I was also the co-chair of the Equity Action Committee. That's a committee between the LEARC, which is uh, the accreditation uh, agent or organization for breastfeeding education for lactation consultants, and ILCA, which is the International Lactation Consultant Association, and the I IBLC, which is the, the Board of Lactation Consultant Examiners. Um, and I, had, I helped co-found a new chapter of La Leche League in Puerto Rico because we needed some more changes around equity when that happened. <laughs> um, I'm a little bit of a, of a rebel and an activist, and, um, but I'm nice. I'm fun at parties. Uh, one of the things I say is that, like an, an, a, another, I used to be an actress when I was in high school, um, and I think I would have liked to be, during the aftermath of, of Maria, I said I wanted to write a stand-up. I had so much material. So I'd like to, to try to make comedy out of some of the things that we went through. Um, okay, so I just I um, I don't have any um, any conflicts to uh, to disclose, and um, I just want us to get to a point where we understand we know this that infants are at the greatest risk. Infants and young children during emergencies are at the greatest risk. Um, lactation is the most important is, is the safe is the the best bet to survive the apocalypse. Okay, um, although. At least in Puerto Rico, as in the United States, as in many countries, as in most of the Americas, most babies are not breastfed. Which means that we as service providers also need to treat all families with humanity. Um, I like some of this, this discussion yesterday when somebody's about not saying, no, don't do that, that we have to figure out different ways. When I was a, uh, an early breastfeeding mother, I thought I was you know, exclusively breastfeeding, which was very, very hard. Um, I had some of that lactivist superiority act attitude, I have to admit, and it wasn't until I became a board-certified lactation consultant that I realized, that I started working with formula and realized that even though formula is what it is and is predatory and that many of the manufacturers don't have the best interests of babies in mind, mothers and parents love their babies and do have the best interests of their babies in mind and maybe not have the information. And in the aftermath of a disaster, formula is going to happen. Okay. And as a community activist and as a community-based lactation professional, I want um, medical doctors and nurses and health professionals to understand that you are key, perhaps as triage and first responders, but most of the activity is going to be happening at the community level and that the knowledge base cannot be limited to health professionals. 
we have to be training parents and families and neighbors and the cafeteria chef who serves food to the moms and the hairdresser. And, okay. So um, I'm going to go through some of this quickly, but I, w I, I want all of you to understand I live in Puerto Rico, which is a tropical island, and every year hurricane season comes, and every year my mother-in-law would gather like little jars and gallons of water and buy candles and we would, you know, and they, and they would tell us to get, have enough food for five days and enough water for five days. But, like, some of her stuff, I would roll my eyes. And when Irma came, because this is, this is Puerto Rico, and Irma came, and it was going to be like this. But she did this, right? And the day after Irma, um, I walked with my kids to Walgreens. I didn't have electricity. We were without electricity for 40 days, but like, you know, Irma tricked us. There were people who live on the eastern end, eastern end of the island. They don't want to negate their reality, but most of the island didn't experience many effects. So, in a, so when two weeks later Maria came, we had no idea that it was going to be the way that it was. And all of you live somewhere where you have a natural disaster, like natural phenomena that happen all the time. And maybe, no, you don't live in Puerto Rico, and you don't have um, a vulnerable power grid, but it could happen, it will happen, it may happen. So even though I knew, we had no idea. Another thing is that um, I had been working since, I wanted, from Save the Children, I had been working with iLactation, which is an online lactation education organization, and I did a translation. I had, he I had heard of, um, you know, that in 2008, I think it was, that the World Breastfeeding Week theme was uh, lactation and emergencies saves lives. Breastfeeding and emergencies saves lives. So I knew that. And then in summer, I did a translation of a, of a presentation of a woman who was doing uh, work with Save the Children in the refugee camps. And that was the first time I had heard the term IYCFE. And then in August, a group of colleagues had said to me, hey, we're doing an online Facebook sort of educational campaign with, uh, that's called Safely Fed USA because it's hurricane season. And I'm like, okay, I'll help. This is all before anything happened. Do you believe in God? <laughs> anyway, so, um, and that's when I'm becoming more familiar and while we're doing some of, if you, if you all use Facebook, there's this group, it's called Safely, or I think it says Infant and Young Child Feeding in Emergencies in USA, but it's backslash Safely Fed USA. And there's a lot of like educational, sort of geared towards families, like very quick, very, kind of social media education about don't forget to stop and feed the baby, uh, about how you feed with a cup if you can't, uh, sanitize bottles, that, those sorts of messages. And one of the things that I found working there was that risk messaging around formula is really not very well received and makes people stop reading the pages. And while I was doing that work, all of a sudden, I said to my colleagues, um, it looks like there's a hurricane coming. <laughs> to Puerto Rico, and that was Irma. Before Irma, everybody in the U.S., like right as it was coming, were like calling me and saying, are you going to evacuate? And I'm like, to where? Um, and the worry, and then it, it didn't really hit us, and then when two weeks later Maria was coming, it's interesting that there wasn't the same outcry of like fear. I think that we were all kind of like sleeping, and even though we knew it was going to be a direct hit, we were just sort of waiting. Anyway, as far as you go, um, a disaster is a calamitous event. A state of emergency arises from the disaster, okay? Um, and the response will be different. The first responders are supposed to be government, um, and then the, the medical and the health facilities, and community uh, organizations and churches may come in, and finally, like, individuals may come to, to work, okay? Um, what are the natural disasters? This is everything that could be, okay, global warming. Um, we know that, that things are changing, okay? The average temperature has risen, um, and we, it, things, we don't see an end in sight. Um, there's more frequent and severe weather around the world. Uh, this is just in the United States last year, in 2017, the different climate incidents. I don't want to scare you, but... 
Okay, and this is just to compare both of them were in September. One was in 1992 and one was in 2017. So 25 years apart. Is that 25 or is it 35? 25? Okay, I'm good at math. Um, but see the difference in the size? There, are, there will be more. As the, as the oceans become hotter, the earth tries to compensate by creating storms to cool down the oceans. And if it's very hot, then she'll make a bigger storm. All right, this is recent, so it's happening all the time. And then human types of disaster, human-made disasters, which can also occur. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can't see the time. I, I thought there was going to be time on the, on, so am I doing okay on time? It's one of the things, like I used to be a really big zombie movie and like zombie TV. I like that genre. Um, and now sometimes I think that zombies are not people with some sort of like disease, but are just very hungry people. Okay, and meanwhile, we understand what the current federal government in the U.S. Um, policy about everything <laughs> in general is. So this, this is the political climate that we're living up against, a global climate, which makes our work very, very challenging. All right, and I'm not a, I'm not a partisan person, but I am very political. So, in general, these are mortality statistics glo uh, globally around um, uh, at the aftermath of, a, of natural or human-made disasters, or natural disasters, this is natural disasters. Um, and this picture, I don't think it doesn't take uh, do justice, but literally, on the, the, the storm of Maria started on the night of the 19th of September. And one of the things that was the most grueling about it was that it literally hovered over us for about 24 hours. Um, the rains were extreme and the winds were extreme. And when it all ended, 100% of Puerto Ricans were without power or telecommunications. In my case, my um, ex-spouse sent me his mother, his mother for both storms, who in fact for me was very, it was a, it was re a relief to have her with me because otherwise it was just going to be me and the kids. The second storm she came kicking and screaming and told him she was going to call the police. And I had to, she's 80 something, and I had to explain to her, if you call the police, they'll probably bring you here. Because <laughs> they live in a flood zone, although the river had been rerouted, um, like two years before the storm, so it actually didn't flood, but we didn't know we hadn't seen a storm. And she did afterwards. She's like, I've never seen anything like this in my life. Where I live, I'm very fortunate. Um, my house is somewhat, well, it's, it's like a 40-year-old house, but it's in an older subdivision. He lives in the barrio. He, li he lives in a, also it's a cement house. It's well made. Most houses which, which are newly made conform to, bu to building standards, which are very good for hurricanes, but are not good for earthquakes. And we also live on a fault line. So let's see what, ha like, like the big thing that they're saying to us now is there hasn't been an earthquake in 100 years. Well, there's like small quakes, but a big one. So who knows what, what, could, ha what could happen. And again, I can talk about Puerto Rico, but think about yourselves too. Like what, is, wh what are the disasters in your, in your or like the sorts of things to which you're subjected to? And maybe I don't have to ask you to, to say it, but just think about it because it could happen, okay? Um, but anyway, during uh, sometime in around uh, 6 in the morning, we realized that a tree from the park had fallen right in front of my house. And at, at some point, you'll see a picture of it. And it scared me. And around 7 o'clock, I, I, I wrote to my sister who lives in, in North Carolina, and I wrote to a dear friend of mine who lives in South Carolina, and I said, a tree fell in front of my house. And I'm scared because I thought it was a projectile. And... As it turns out, it shielded my house. So while my neighbors lost like terraces and garages, I was protected by that tree. But literally before I sent that message, 
my phone went, and then I wasn't able to com communicate with my sister for 48 hours to tell her that I was okay. And then I had to go, first I went to Walgreens, because somebody told me there was a signal at Walgreens. Um, I only had like a quarter tank of gas, because I had gassed up before Irma, but I hadn't before Maria. It's ve all very close, I live in a small town. But when you only have a quarter tank of gas and nothing is open, abs literally nothing is open. The gas stations didn't open till Monday and the storm was on, on Wednesday. Um, and when they opened, I sent my ex-spouse to fill up to gas up the car and he was gone for 10 hours and came back. He's a, he's a dark complected person and he was scorched from the sun because you can't just sit in your car for the 10 hours that you're doing the gas line. Um, and they only accepted cash and they only allowed him to put $20 of gas. So he put 15 in my car and five in his, ta in his can. Um, so I finally got signal at the plaza and it was just like text message signal. And I was able to communicate that I was okay. And I had a friend who, like slowly all of us started, st friends that we started sending messages to each other, are you okay? But I had a friend who lived in the center, in the mountain, and it took me a week to hear from her. So it was also the fear that all your friends were dead. And for some people, your friends were dead. All right. The official, you may have heard this because as, as emerging news, um, the official count of the Puerto Rico government is that 64 people died in the storm. I think they only counted people who like a roof cut their head off or a tree fell on them uh, during, the, during the winds and rains. But there was a Harvard study, which was released last week, wasn't it? Which puts the estimate at 4,645 deaths. If you know anything about statistics, it's a survey that they did. And what they did is that they took a cross-section of families and they asked them, Do you know, did you have anybody who died during after the storm? And they have a range of numbers that goes from 640 to 8,000, almost 9,000. So I think this is the midpoint. I think this is an accurate number. I think it may be higher. I know um, the, the amount of milk. For, for a, I, I was fortunate. I was without electricity for two and a half months. At this point, um, most people have electricity, but many still don't. Uh, so the, uh, the, the one thing that, that came to me as I was looking at the park in front of my house, which had lost 80% of the trees, which was flooded, and the mere devastation was just thinking about the amount, the gallons and gallons of human milk that was being dumped down, down the drain. People trying, during Irma, La, La Leche League of Puerto Rico had negotiated with Walmart that if there's a storm and there may be power outages that they would store personal milk stashes for people but the Walmart in my community didn't open for three weeks because their roof caved in and they were flooded. Um, I, I uh, leptospirosis. Have you? Did you hear about the? Do you know what leptospirosis is? Leptospirosis is an animal. Zo they call it a zoologic disease, and it was present in the water, possibly because of um, animal corpses floating in the water, perhaps because of feces. But our water was infected, infested, infected. And I, I know of at least two close people whose family members died of leptospirosis. Um, remember that when a baby dies, they classify it as SIDS or as a respiratory infection or as... They, they, don't, they don't attribute it to the milk. They don't attribute it to their life situations. Okay. Um, and I think the, a lot of these statistics are things that we know about the fact that Lactation is not given in the priority it is in many um, national uh, po policies, all right? Puerto Rico in particular, this is before the storm, for the first time in 2016 started reporting to um, doing the, the breastfeeding report card with the CDC, okay? Um, Puerto Rico has high breastfeeding initiation rates, although it's the highest in supplementation in the first few days is one of the highest, all right? But um, at six months, it drops to 37.1 and, and then 21.2 at 12 months. And these statistics inc are, include partial breastfeeding. Although we also have the WIC effect, 
which is that there are a number of families who are exclusively breastfeeding, but don't. 85% of, of children under the age of five in Puerto Rico participate in the WIC program. 85%. 85% of our population is, is eligible for some sort of federal means based benefit. Um, it, so that they will go to WIC, and even if they're exclusively breastfeeding, we'll say that they aren't. Or if they're partially breastfeeding, we'll say that they're not breastfeeding at all, so they, they get more formula. So that they can either sell it, black market on eBay, or, uh, or, or give it to a friend. All right. Um, these, I think you, you know these statistics, the global report card, so I'm not going to go through all of these statistics. But... I will say that in the Americas in general, um, lactation is decreasing, but some of the dynamics are different. At least in Puerto Rico, it's, it's the same as the United States because the, the means-based benefits give formula. It's an, it's an easy out. Um, so that um, in, in, in Latin America, sometimes um, formula, like formula feeding is seen as prestigious. Whereas in the United States and Puerto Rico, breastfeeding, because it requires special specialists and a fancy person with many letters after their name, which I want to say is not necessary, but is then prestigious, all right? So what happens with a storm, okay? Um, the poor governance of a natural disaster will create more poverty and will create more hunger and, um, all right. So this is what happened. After the storm, um, I had this dream before the storm, and that's why I went to get my master's degree. All right? I wanted to open a clinic, and I wanted it to be here in Caguas. I live over here in Dorado. Because I thought, well, that's pretty central. People from Ponce will go here. The only people who might not is here in Mayagüez. But um, my idea was that um, I wanted to have a clinic that would provi provide free or low-cost low lactation services to, to parents while at the same time providing lactation training to community-based people with the goal, I mean, I, I believe in the IBCLC. That's something I believe in as an IBCLC. And as a community-trained IBCLC, not as a health professional-trained IBCLC, that I wanted to share that love. When the storm happened, I realized we don't need a clinic. I, I started going and visiting shelters. And one of the first things I found in, the, in the, first, uh, the first two shelters that I visited was that infant and young child feeding wasn't, was not considered a health issue, all right? They were giving mandatory talks to all of the sheltered residents on leptospirosis, on scabies, on lice, and on, um, I can't remember, but on some of the transmittable diseases. And then I said, but what about formula preparation? And they're like, no, 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 that's a personal decision. Um, they were not given access to the kitchen in order to disinfect or to clean the feeding equipment. They were not provided, um, uh, boy, they were provided gallons of water and they were given baby bottles and they would wash the baby bottles in these buckets with soap in their rooms. So I had to work a bit with the shelter staff to talk about so, uh, somebody needs to give them act access to disinfect the cleaning equipment or you need to start giving them cups or I did research and we found about, out, out, about bleach sterilization. So training the residents on how, how do you disinfect. So from there I got the idea. I said, well, what I want to do, I'm just going to do a community training and I'm going to start recruiting to people, people to be part of the organization. So I, there was a maternal child center in San Juan, which is one of the first places it opened and started. It's called MAM, Mujeres Ayudando Madres. Um, that there's, you'll, you may see some stuff online. Like you may have seen some stuff. There was like a Vox, I think, um, uh, report on them. But... They gave me space and I did a, a training. And that's where I recruited like some, four of my first people to be part of the organization. I want to thank Save the Children because they gave me seed money. So the, I decided what I wanted to have was 10 people who were regionally located, and we called them portavoces, our core group members, that we would provide some sort of financial incentive because it's great to be a volunteer, but everybody needs to feed their children. So that we would provide them, a, you know, usually thinking about like moms or parents or people who maybe had other things going on, um, but to become very highly ex ex to be experts in infant and young child feeding, so that they could work regionally. So that was the model that I that I developed. Okay, um, after the disaster, okay, 
there was no telecommunications. What did that mean? You weren't able to call people, you weren't able to use the internet, but also if you went to a store, you couldn't pay because your cash card didn't work. Um, if you tried to take money out of the bank, you couldn't because it wasn't working. Where I live in Dorado, when finally a bank opened, it was one bank, there was one ATM, and it took about five hours to take your money out. Um, there wasn't, uh, there, w there was no lactation support in the shelters, okay? There wasn't clean, a space to prepare your formula or to clean your feeding equipment. They didn't really, weren't giving them bleach or anything to disinfect, okay? Um, nobody, ice, you couldn't find ice or water in any stores. Every store you would walk to, into, you couldn't even find a cold Coca-Cola, okay? Every store was like, no hay hielo, no hay agua. No, uh, solo efectivo. So no ice, no water, cash only. And that was our reality for anywhere from three to six weeks, depending on where you lived. All right? Um, and uh, formula started raining in. When, when people who want to help and with very well-meaning intentions want to feed the babies. So one of the first items that comes in is formula. Now, ironically, I, had a, I got a call, and I don't know how they, how they called me. I think it was because of, I was a, a La Leche League leader at the time from some police officers' wives in New Jersey. And they sent me formula. But we used the formula. We, we did find, because for, you could not find formula in the stores either. And WIC in most communities did not open. And if you went to a government office that opened two to three weeks after the storm, it was literally three women, maybe a man, a white table, and a paper roster. And um, so most of them were dealing with like immediate emergencies, but WIC took a while to open. And there still are like about 14 WIC clinics which are not online and are, and are manually entering. We're, September, June, we're talking eight months later, okay? That still, it was, I mean, although they say it was a category four, some of them were category five wins. And we were, everything that, you, that you've heard is true and is worse. And um, I, 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 I want you all to understand, I was doing lactation. I was, you know, I was, I, I was just like all of you. It's just that all of a sudden this storm came, all right? Um, so this is um, who, the shelters are prior, have, have their priorities for who they're gonna uh, come in. Single parents, then uh, married, if they're pregnant, okay? They meet the feeding, the, the feeding needs of the infants, okay? And they also give priority to people who have restraining orders or legal warrants, et cetera, okay? And, ch and pr child protective services may help to place a family into a shelter. Um, we were, the ACI, which is Alimentación Segura Infantil, I ended up incorporating it in October, and a, a friend on the ground in the United States is the one who did it for me. Because during that, when, when my phone finally came up, I could send text messages, I could make calls, but my internet on the phone did, you know this? But all the time, at, like at two or three in the morning is when I could get, and I guess it's because other people were sleeping. So the, the load, because I, I literally think there were like two satellites in all of Puerto Rico that were feeding all of the phones like right after the storm, okay? Um, so I wanted, to, so Alimentación Segura Infantil, and I love acronyms. So ASI, the word ASI in Spanish means like this or like that, okay? Um, so it's been catchy, and it's, it's helped to, like, to get people on. Um, what we want to do, as I said, is to try to train the community. So the, um, um, and it's focused on equity, all right? What... We try to do is recruit the participants, the staff and the volunteers and the service recipients to add to the diversity of our organization, not just for photo ops or prestige, okay? Um, we don't think, like, although yes, I have, I have a knowledge base that other people ha don't have. My hope is to pass that on to other people, not to, um, to get more credit for what I'm doing. I th sometimes I think that as, as lactation acti or activists or lactation professionals, one of the best things that can happen with a parent that we work with is that they say, I did it, as opposed to them saying, if it weren't for you, I would not have done it. Um, okay, when, 
somebody is looking for services on feeding, on how do I treat this, the, the bump in my breast that I don't know what's going on, what kind of baby bottle should I use, they don't usually ask their doctor first. They don't usually ask a nurse first. They ask their mother, they ask their sister, they ask their neighbor, or they ask Facebook. Okay, so that's who we want to have the knowledge about how do, you, how do you feed your baby and how do you respond to this emergency. Okay, another thing is that gendered and risk-based language is alienating to millennials. So talking always about like mother's milk and leche materna and um, uh, formula kills is, is alienating. So we try to talk more about human milk, leche humana, lactancia to be more neutral. Uh, there was a GLAD study which was done recently that said that 50% of millennials identify gender on a spectrum and up to 15% don't identify with the gender that they were assigned at birth. So that although we know that for gender equity we have to talk about mothers, for gender equity we also have to realize that there may be somebody who comes through the door who does not personally identify as a mother who is birthing and, and, and lactating. So how do we also provide services to people who don't tradi traditionally seek our services? All right. Um, a model that trains and simultaneously provides services creates a web that grows. We want to create a knowledge base and job skills primarily to female and non-gendered heads of households that makes them marketable and maybe have job skills that can help them be hired and make money for their families in the future. And dependence on government is not necessary when the government is not available because our government did not respond very well to the storm and is still not responding very well. I think they're making a lot of money off of the relief services. And meanwhile, a lot of private citizens are trying to get things off the ground. All right, so we do no-cost community workshops on safe infant and child feeding. And the condition is, because you know, a lot of community workshops that will offer you a certificate and will and, and that are offered by accredited people will usually you know charge anywhere from twenty five to fifty to one hundred dollars. What I said what I said to everybody was this training is free provided that what because we were doing them in October and we started like um, like prorating the the amount of people you impact twenty five people before the onset of next storm season with at least one bit of information that you learn from this training and then ask them to to give back the documentation of what they were doing. So we give, you give back. Um, and then we do local support groups around the island with regional, um, with our portavoces who have, been, who have been trained and access to a local IBCLC. We don't necessarily go to the homes of the families, the IBCLCs, because it's hard. What we try to do is that we have the first responders be like, able to do very good triage. And then if it's necessary for an IBCLC to respond, we try to get them to bring the mom or the parent to the support group. And if they're not able to come to the support group, then we'll go to their home or go to a, a location near, close to them, okay? I train 12 people because 10 of them are being comp compensated, but two of them are on my board. Um, and I did the 35-hour um, WHO training on infant and young child feeding, So, which, which is, if you, you can download this online, okay? It's a gift from the World Health Organization. So don't downplay it. And it, some of it is a, it's very simple, and some of it is maybe a little bit um, outdated. So you'll just update it with your own language. And I actually went through, because in Spanish, lactation is so gendered. I went through with a PDF editor and did a lot of like fixing of the language so that it would be more um, relevant to us. But it includes a lactation component. It includes a substitute feeding component. component. So we actually did a lab, with, like, on, like we prepared formula in a, ki in a kitchen in somebody's home, because that's how we were doing our trainings. We did them like in somebody's office, in a home, in a chiropractor's office, um, in the library. You know, we found different spaces, but at the one way that we did in a kitchen in somebody's home, we prepared infant formula according to the World Health. Have you all had, have, well, you all have most of your doctors. Have you prepared formula before? Okay. Because, you know, a lot, uh, it's, it's an impor it's a, important thing to know, because when you tell somebody to do something, it helps if you actually did it. All right, um, and then now we are in the process of starting our volunteer program, which will be something like what La Leche League leaders are. Um, they're called casicas, again, because I like um, acronyms. Uh, cas with a C, the cacique and casica with a C is an indigenous community leader. 
but this is com uh, Consejero en Alimentación Segura Infantil Comunitarias, which is an acronym. Um, and people are really excited. And we just got a letter this week from the IBLCE, which is the Board of Lactation Consultant Examiners, that we've been recognized as a peer counselor organization to accrue your 1,000 unsupervised hours under Pathway 1. Um, we are capable, I used to before, <laughs> it's, it's definitely um, uh, uh, like, yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm overwhelmed. Sometimes I feel like I'm just a vessel and there's this thing that was put in my hand and I just have to listen. I have to listen to the universe and I just have to keep going with it. We now see enough parents weekly that we're able to do also Pathway 3, which is the 500 hour uh, mentorship with an IBCLC. If anyone wants to come to Puerto Rico, it may take you like a year to do it, but we're able to offer that. I don't know how we're going to offer it, if we're going to charge money, if we're, you know, because we're struggling with income right now. We thanks, Save the Children gave us some seed money. We were operated with an IMC, which is International Medical Corps grant. Um, and now we're doing um, a global, I can't remember what the name of the, um, or, uh, I can't remember the name of the, I'm sorry, I have to, I, what, what, the, the, the fund that we're working with right now. But we're still struggling with funds to, to, to continue to, or to, to, to run, but I'm confident that it will keep happening. Okay? Um, we have a warm line. We have a, fo a phone line now for people to call. The people who operate the phone line are our, our portavoces and our casicas, and they're instructed to, like, if somebody sends you a text message, call them back. Um, and we want to validate that peer and community-based knowledge is the backbone of our work. Okay. Um, let me see. Some of this you know. Oh, that was there already. Okay, so we had to rebuild from scratch. The tree, this is in front of my, this is my, these are my personal photos, okay? The tree there actually is bittersweet because that was the tree that fell in front of my house. The neighbors were the ones who cut it halfway to clear the path so that cars could go through, and then it became a playground. And then finally somebody came and mutilated the tree, and now it's just a dead stump in front of the park, in front of my house. Um, that was one of the, we went, when, when I ran out of gas, and I, or I don't know if I had run out of gas yet, or if I had, it was the first time that I drained the battery on the car, charging the, telephones and we decided to walk to the plaza instead of going in the car or we didn't we, and because I wanted to, to communicate with my sister and that was one of the gas stations this was the part the to the right here is the park in front of my house flooded all right um, I said I was a zombie movie uh, fan and I've said this to a few of you who have been here when the apocalypse comes you're not going to be able to go to a gas station and, <laughs> um, uh, and just pump your gas. You're not going to be able to go to an abandoned building and turn on the water faucet because all of those systems require electricity. And in our case, it's petroleum because our, our electricity in Puerto Rico is at least all petroleum-based. And it requires somebody, a woman, a man, a group of people who are operating the system. So this is what it's going to be like. Um, I already said that safe infant formula preparation was labeled as a choice. Okay, The primary amount of help is directed at, at parents or adults and not at children. All right. Um, there wasn't an emergency response plan that included uh, lactation. And again, formula, like, it's something that you would see um, uh, the mayor's wife of a certain town would say, we have formula. Um, it's just, it, it's just something that, pe and, and people, it, it had to be, has to be purple good start. I have to have purple good start. If not, I won't be able to feed my baby. And we also had to, you know, so people, like, since I had formula, people were like, oh, my baby's drinking Nutramiheng. And I'm like, well, I have Alimentum. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my baby drinks Similac. Similac. Well, I have this stuff with the yellow top from Costco. All right. Um, we know that breastfeeding support groups are a very, very effective way of supporting families that doesn't require a lot of high-tech knowledge from people. 
Okay, I, these are some things that I came up with, like t vital tips and actions, okay? That there need to be lactation resources that the government needs to be aware of. Um, there have to be public education campaigns during storm season that lactation saves lives. Um, survival tips about what's your survival kit should include, shouldn't say, oh, enough infant formula. They should say enough extra water for the breastfeeding parent. Um, information about the difference between people think they dry up because of the oxytocin effect, but it's really just delayed letdown, delayed milk ejection. Okay. Um, the lines for relief should um, have resting space for parents with babies, and parents need to be reminded, take your baby with you. Because if you think it's going to, like, I thought it was going to be three hours to get gas, but if it turns out to be 10 hours and you left your baby with your mom, you're going to stop breastfeeding at the end of all of it, and your mom is going to give the baby formula or malanga con agua y leche carnation. <laughs> um, Discourage formula donation to shelters, to the breastfeeding families. Um, adequate information about how to safeguard your personal milk stash. Um, government would ideally provide locations to store your milk stash so you don't have to depend on If they have shelters and the shelters have electricity, couldn't the shelters have freezers for families in the community? Um, breast pump donations are also not very safe or viable when there's not electricity. Um, safe wet nursing should be an option. Um, about formula don donating, uh, donation, first provide breastfeeding support. Um, make sure you understand what the use-by dates are because lots of formula is about to expire when it's arrived. Unbrand it. Um, if you're going to donate it to somebody, write on it with a Sharpie with the name of the person and say not for resale. Okay, and ideally single serving ready to feed is the cleanest type of infant uh, formula. Um, again, unlabeled tins. Um, make sure that you're not giving anything that's subject to recall. Um, clean designated areas for, for feeding and for infant formula preparation. And um, if there are relief responders that come from outside communities, that's wonderful, but please don't uh, displace local workers, because that can happen too. All right, this is one of our workshops in the community. Pictures of some of the things that we do. And then this is, this is some of the low-cost stuff that we, I don't know if you can appreciate it, but to the, this one is what we call a haka, but that's the brand of it, but it's like a, a $5 silicone hand pump, pretty easy to clean, cheap, you can just go, and it can either, like what we say, go ahead, pon con la bajada. It like will will take will hitchhike along with the with the letdown from the other breasts, or you can kind of like manually squeeze it. Okay, all right. Um, and in terms of relactation kits, because one of our primary calls is relactation, is I don't know how many of you are, are doing these in your consultations, but you don't have to buy a Medela SNS. Um, this is just a, a nasogastric tube and syringes, all right? We give the little syringe so that they clean out the nasogastric tube, and the big tubes are to hold either the expressed milk and the, or, the, or the formula that they're using. And of course, Every family that we work with, we're, te we're teaching them um, hand expression. We, we can't give enough credit to what hand expression does. All right? The, if you look at the stars on the map, the stars indicate where our portavoces are located in, right now. Okay, and then this is like a look at some of our data, all right? The majority of the people who are receiving services from our program are between the ages of 20 and 29. All right, but there is a range. Um, the majority are first consultations. 
and these are in-person visits, so there may be like texting and stuff going on in, 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 as, as follow-up, but in terms of like the, the, uh, the very intense consultations. All right, this is a breakdown by um, municipality, and between November and May, we worked with 712 individuals. These are the different municipals, municipalities in Puerto Rico. Okay, what is the type of infant feeding that they're doing? Um, or the, the, by color, so 6% is complementary feeding, 18% um, is complementary feeding and formula, 3% uh, is lactation and formula, and all feeding types by color. Okay, um, and then again, the age range of the infants. And then asking, did the hurricane affect the way that you feed your child or your children? 40% um, said yes, 35% no, and for 24.3% it didn't apply because they hadn't been feeding their baby before the storm. We're about to see this month a number of babies who were conceived during the storms. We also know that we lost a lot, a lot of parents with young children left Puerto Rico. Before the storm, we were already in an economic crisis. And our, like I, between 2015 and 2016, between Zika and the initial exodus because of the, um, the economic crisis, our birth population had already dropped 12% in one year in hospitals. And I have, we haven't seen the official statistics this year, but it's an estimate that about uh, one quarter of the population left, but some of those people are coming back. And wherever people live, babies will be born. All right. Um, how many people knew about the information that we were providing um, beforehand? Um, only 5% said yes. All right. Um, because 13% were follow-up visits, it didn't apply, but 21% said no, and 61% didn't know all of it. So we do feel like we're giving them new information. All right, how many of you applied the recommendations that we gave you? 60% said they applied all of it, 38% said some, and 2% said none. All right, and there's still a lot to be done in Puerto Rico. It's June 7th today. So we're six days into the new storm season. We live on a fault line. Um, Jabucoa, which is here, and that's where the storm entered, 40% of their residents still don't have electrical power as of when I wrote this presentation. Okay, that's 16,000 people who remain in the dark. The government, when asked, are you, pre are you prepared for the storm? They said, yeah, a lot of people have generators now. Um, this, is it here? No, it's here. Where's the, here, it's here. The car, that's literally an intersection that I pass every day of my life. A street, a street light fell on a car where a mother with her five-year-old infant and her mother. And luckily nobody was injured, although you can see, I mean, can you see that glass? Can you see the, the impact to that car? The major, like, after the storm, no intersections were working. Uh, then uh, slowly they were working, but I would say like up until about two, up until, up until this happened, about 40% of intersections still weren't working. It took this to happen for them to be like, oh, <laughs> okay. Um, and, uh, and so now they're starting to, to get many more, uh, more lights working. But you, can't, you can only kind of imagine, I said, in one of the towns, you know that uh, that I don't know how it, I know in some, in some in the United States some of the intersections it's illegal because it's like nicer here, but in Puerto Rico at most of the street light it's not illegal so you'll have people who sell water you have people what people were selling washboards so that you could um, wash w without electricity but there are also like homeless or drug addicted people who are asking for money well in Caguas they are the ones who have been directing traffic. And they've been doing it well, and it's been, you know, a, a, a way for them to serve and, to, and people will give them a tip. Because the, the government wasn't doing it. They weren't sending the police. Okay, these are some of the me like memes. We have a, pa a page that we started doing, okay. Apoyo la lactancia humana, the 
nativity scene with a battery was a project that I did with my son, actually, um, with recycled material. Um, uh, uh, like the Rosie the Riveter for um, sink, uh, the World Women's Day about how to clean your your equipment, uh, warning them about there's going to the they there's going to be a power outage tomorrow or the water will be taken from this community. And um, that's it. <laughs> no. no? It will in a minute? Oh, yeah, it was slow. Here okay. it is. Thank you for that amazing journey that you shared with us that you've had this last year. I think it really gives us a flavor for uh, emergencies. And I think, as you say, most of us have faced emergencies. Um, you went through some of your slides very quickly. And I was just wondering if you have a sense of the impact you know, uh, of breastfeeding um, in in your disasters is, is how much did Keeping you in help? mind that a lot of the statistics are, are, are compiled right around this time for what happened last year. I do participate in the breastfeeding coalition that doesn't call itself a breastfeeding coalition. It's called El Grupo Colaborativo for political reasons because there's another group that calls itself Coalición. But anyway, um, I know the statistics will come out um, but they're not, for example, we have a 49% C-section rate before Maria. I don't doubt that we have a higher C-section rate after Maria. Um, after, um, and, and this may have happened also in the U.S., but after, for example, AH1, N1, it was an excuse to not give babies to parents and, 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 like, and like just ignore the rooming in law. So we, we don't have the statistics. But I don't doubt that our, uh, that our, uh, we were doing better in breastfeeding, and I don't doubt that it's much worse. Because literally, when, when lactation is most needed is when it was abandoned because of the long cues, because of the, fr the, the ready availability of formula, because of the stress, because of the heat, because of the fact that you can't express breast milk with an electric pump. I would, can't tell you how many mothers I went to visit who I'd be like, but are you, have, have you been, you know, they had been given instructions to pump by somebody. I'm like, are you pumping? And they're like, oh, only at night when I turn on the generator. Which is why, like, if you're not doing it, I think you all are, but if you're not, please teach every single person how to hand express. It's so simple. It's so, so simple and so effective. You know, because when there's no electricity, when there's no water, you're always going to have this. When, they, when it comes out, I'm, it, we will share the information for sure. And there are doctors from Puerto Rico who are part of the ABM. Hi, um, Mary Champany from Helen Keller International. Uh, earlier this week, um, I and I think a few other colleagues in the room were at the core group meeting, which is um, a big coalition of global health and public health organizations. And the first day on Monday, there was a plenary session about the crisis in Cox's Bazaar, Bangladesh, with um, the huge influx of Rohingya Muslims. Mm -hmm. And um, the only mention of breastfeeding in this plenary session was just sort of an offhand comment about how difficult IYCFE is on the ground and how mothers, they just don't have milk because they're stressed. And so I think there is a big need within the development and humanitarian community as, as practitioners, um, just a, a need for education and correction of misconceptions about, about breastfeeding. Um, and so I'm wondering, especially because, you know, these humanitarian crises with climate change and with political issues, they're becoming the norm. Um, and just if you have any ideas about how development and humanitarian professionals can address the gaps in our own service, that'd be great. Thank you. That's a, like, that's a big charge. I, I think that you have to be present. It's like what I said, to give the example, when I went to the shelters and they treated infant feeding as a personal choice issue and not as a public health issue, um, I could work individually with the, shelter, with the shelter workers, but what that means is right now I'm working with the Department of Housing to make sure that they understand that infant feeding is as important to talk about as leptospirosis and scabies and lice and whatever, uh, and, and the flu, I think that was the other thing that they were educating on, you know. Um, I don't have the one answer. I, th I think it in t to, some, it to some extent it requires that we infiltrate these groups. Um, but 
my idea would be is if we're doing enough training of people on the ground, then those people on the ground will also infiltrate the groups. So because I'm sure you're swamped, so that it can't be only one person. And what's funny is like two or three years ago, I was the crazy person on the ground screaming about equity and when, how we had to go to the communities. And not to say I am, because like I said, sometimes I feel like I'm just a vessel. But we've worked with 700 people in eight months. You know, um, I, I feel like we effectively we're doing a very do, doing very effective work. So, the part for you is to is to also empower and train people in the community on those issues, because those are going to be the ones who are going to be doing the IYCFE work. Hi, hi, I'm Grace Damio from the Hispanic Health Council in Connecticut, and I mean I I don't even know how to start with all that's gone through me as I listen to you. Um, the first is tremendous work, but in the backdrop of it, I'm starting to hate the word resilience because it it's so overused. Mm -hmm. And the resilience of you personifying the people of Puerto Rico in the midst of this horrific, horrific situation is incredible because it's not only surviving, it's moving forward like you have been doing. And then what goes on through my mind is we should not you should not have to be doing this in these circumstances, and the whole island should not have to be. So when we've, in the, you know, yesterday throughout the day, there was policy discussions that bumped up beyond specifics of breastfeeding to healthcare policy, et cetera. And we've been, you know, this talk was full of climate change issues. And in the backdrop, of course, is the, you know, inexcusable inadequacy of the U.S. response to this disaster. And in terms of advocacy, I think both of those are things that are in the backdrop. Of course, they affect breastfeeding, and they affect so much else in terms of equity and just human dignity and justice. Mm -hmm. So I just need to say that because it's so pervasive and has been since this disaster happened and even before that. But you've been symbolizing so much of uh, what's been heroic about the Puerto Rican if people If the government right isn't going to... But uh, what's funny is I, I, have a, I have a friend who, like, right after Mr. Trump and Mr. Rosselló were elected, which wasn't what we were... I, where I was hoping for, and we, she, like, did a live on Facebook, and she said, the government, if they gave us something... It was for eight years, right? If they gave us something, that was, that was cool, but... We ha the communities are going to have to organize ourselves. And it really, that, that's what showed during, during Maria. So um, did you notice that the AAP has a, a position? They, when they did the presentation, they mentioned IYCFE. And somebody said the ABM is looking for new. That's, this is going to be a new, one of the new ABM protocols is infant and young child feeding and emergencies. Yep, exactly. So, you know, it's the emerging issue because it's the, the emerging global issue. Thank you so much.